Notice that in this diagram uz is the x axis. So instead of x I should write here uz and if I expand do algebra from this expression I will get uz is equal to I will get this expression. If you expand it and write uz equal to something then do algebra and you will get an expression which is only this part. Since theta was 0 and since in this diagram we did not consider any pressure gradient so basically this term becomes 0. So this is the velocity profile in that case the equation of line a dash b dash. So the velocity profile I have given here. Imagine a situation where u1 is equal to u2 magnitude wise and also both u1 and u2 act in the same direction. Then I will expect that this line will move in this way and strictly speaking it is not a shear rather a translation is happening. Suppose these are the shears u1 and u2. What I have done? Instead of top to the right sense of shearing of u1, I have given it top to left and instead of top and this u2 shear in this direction, I have given opposite. So what change will happen in this equation? Basically, I have to replace plus u1 by minus u1 and minus u2 by plus u2. What if both u1 and u2 are acting in the same direction but with different rates. For example, the u1 velocity is bigger than the u2 velocity as per my diagram see the half arrow this half arrow is bigger this half arrow is smaller both are moving in that direction. So if there is a line like this the line would shift Okay. So, in this case where is the pivot or the neutral point? The neutral point in this case can be visualized that if I extend this line down and if I extend this line down the neutral point goes outside the shear zone, outside the simple shear zone. I can write the pivot goes outside the shear zone. What will be the manifestation in the shear zone in such a shear? There will be top to right sense of shearing throughout. Can that be distinguished only from the shear fabric if this kind of shearing is happening? The answer is no. The reason is that both in this case and this in that case the same top to the right sense of shearing will be produced. So the shear sense indicators SC fabric, mineral fish, sigma structure, delta structures, intrafolial folds and anything else will all show top to the right sense of movement. So looking at the shear sense alone in the field we cannot be sure whether this one happened or that one happened. And in fact geologically it is very difficult to comment which one moved at a faster rate, whether the bottom wall was static and the top wall moved, whether the bottom boundary moved and the top wall was static. In all these cases, same shear sense will be produced which is top to the right sense of shearing. Can we find out the pivot's coordinate? Yes, it is possible to find out from that equation. Now we can see the equation that we are dealing for such a situation is much simpler than that one. 
whatever I am speaking for this equation, the same principles will work for here I am going to demonstrate what is the orientation of the position coordinate of the pivot, same thing can be done for this equation as well. So, what to do? The intersection of a dash b dash line on the y axis, this axis has an equation u z equal to 0. So, if I put here u z equal to 0, I will get some value of y equal to y 5. So, I can write that the pivot has a coordinate 0 comma y 5. Now, it can be demonstrated that you can try algebraically if this is plus u 1 and this is plus u 2, both she are applying by moving the walls in the same direction which is to our right hand side. In that case, the pivot's coordinate this y 5 becomes more than y 0 and you will find actually y 5 coming as a negative number. So, I can write that minus y 5 is lesser than minus y 0 which means this point is minus y 0, 0 comma minus y 0 and the pivot will come over there which is a situation of this kind of shearing. You see the pivot goes over here. Okay. Now, the pivot's position will also depend on the shear rate of the upper and the lower boundary. Let me demonstrate that. Let us take this case that the top boundary is sheared with a velocity plus u 1 and the bottom boundary is sheared with a velocity minus u 1. So, what I have done in this equation, the u 2 magnitude becomes same as the u 1 magnitude but note that they are working in opposite direction. In that case, you can find out that the pivot lies at the 0, 0 origin point. This is a 0, 0 or the origin point. This 0, 0 or the origin point is equidistant from the two boundaries. This is y 0 unit, that is y 0 unit, the total is 2 y 0 unit. So, which means if the two boundaries are shared with same magnitude, but in opposite direction, in that case the pivot lies in the lies equidistant from the two boundaries. These concepts are important and along with the strain analysis, these are also to be remembered when you are studying a natural shear zone and trying to see whether such models fit or do not fit. If I consider another situation where u2 is equal to 0, and u 1 is more than 0, this is the situation bottom boundary is static and the top boundary moves in that direction with some velocity. My common sense says that the marker will be displaced or the velocity profile will look like that and this velocity profile intersects the bottom of the shear zone and if we find out the, if I put u 2 over here simplify and then find out the pivot, I will find that the coordinate of the pivot is turning out to be 0 comma minus y 0. So, which means if this boundary is static and the top boundary is moving, the pivot will be lying on the bottom boundary. The opposite is also true. For example, if the bottom boundary is moving and the top boundary is static, then the pivot will lie on the top boundary. How to represent that? We can represent in this way u 2 is less than 0 and u 1 equal to 0. This is given by this situation that the top boundary is static and the bottom boundary is slipping. In that case, the marker or the velocity profile will look like this, like this is the line and it intersects the y axis at this point and in this case you can find out that the pivot is given by 0 comma y 0 coordinate. That means, the y 5 value will be same as the y 0 which you can deduce. 
I have a request to those who are watching the video, do not just keep on watching. Whenever I am saying from this equation, this can be derived or I say that integrating twice and using the boundary conditions, I get this. You must stop the video and write by your own, otherwise you will never learn. In the class, I never give a clear cut and so direct writing. At every point, I stop and I ask the student solve it. So what I finish in the classroom, say for within one hour, I'm finishing here within 20 minutes. So I repeat, whenever I'm writing an equation and you have slightest of the doubt, and even, even if there is no doubt, do keep writing. Without writing, this will not enter permanently in your mind. Okay, so now this being discussed, as I told you, the same concepts you can also use for this deformation, the pivot's position that u1 and u2 are in the same direction, where is the pivot? So for that, you have to work with this equation, put here the uz is equal to 0, find out the y value can be done. What we are talking in terms of the strain analysis for the ductile shear zone is certainly an ideal one. There can be many non-ideal situations. We have considered that these boundaries are completely rigid and when that flow happens, these boundaries themselves are not deforming. This may be true as per the literature, if I think that there are two rock units and here some flow is happening, say this is rock unit A, this is rock unit B and the flow of the, part of the material C is happening, then A and B can be can be completely or effectively whatever you say rigid if the viscosity of A is more than or equal to 5 times the viscosity of the unit C or and also for the layer B mu B the dynamic viscosity of the rock unit B is more than or equal to 5 times the viscosity of unit C. Now rock A and rock B may have different viscosities, so the two boundaries can have different viscosities. Is this satisfied in the field or not is a question and what will happen if this is not the case, say A and B are soft materials and within which another soft fluid is flowing such that the viscosity contrast between A and C is not enormous like what I have said and also the viscosity contrast between C and B or the viscosity ratio is not that enormous what I have said. In that case actually the boundaries will also deform during the flow. So these boundaries, rigid boundaries will no more be rigid. In fact, it will be deformable boundary. And if the boundaries are deformable naturally, whatever we have discussed will not work in that case. There are several other simplifications in the models that I, have was, I was discussing here and over there. We have considered a single fluid flowing. In reality, in the shear zone, there can be number of layers, let us say granite and schist, so let us say sandstone and limestone. They have their different viscosities, so two or three materials can be conceived to be arranged in parallel as parallel layers and then the shearing is applied. So that is another realistic step in modeling the ductile shear zones. Let us understand the concept of slip boundary condition and no slip boundary condition. We find this in the fluid mechanics books and we need to understand and we can further this concept in the ductile shear zone kinematics. Let us take a coet flow situation, the bottom boundary is static and the top boundary is slipped. So the fluid here and represented by an inactive marker here will be moved as a straight line. In this case, in the no slip boundary condition, the velocity with which the top boundary is moved, say u1 velocity, the fluid in contact with this wall will also attain that u1 velocity. The velocity with which the boundary has moved, the fluid in contact also moves with the same velocity. In that case, we say there is no slip boundary condition. Here the word no slip 
means that there is no apparent slip or there is no slip between the boundary and the fluid which is touching it. In other words, the fluid is perfectly sticking the boundary. Now what happens in case of a slip boundary condition? You can see this half arrow of same size I have added here u1 but what has happened is that the fluid in contact with this boundary is not taking up this u1 velocity. The fluid takes up some velocity but it is not this fluid is not perfectly sticking with this boundary therefore the fluid retards. So you can see here this angle theta 1 and this angle theta 2 same velocity I have applied u1 at the top there is one kind of fluid and one kind of boundary there is another kind of boundary another kind of fluid but when the same rate is applied for slip u1 and u1 we can see that theta 1 is more than theta 2. So this is a case where there is a slip happening between the moving boundary and the fluid and we call it as a slip boundary condition. So what we were doing here that I am applying a u1 velocity and the fluid within the channel also picks up the u1 velocity which is in contact is a no slip boundary condition. Now here a doubt appears sometimes once it is said no slip the geology student thinks that there is no velocity applied that is not the case. This slip with u1 velocity is not the meaning of the no slip here and here also when I say slip boundary condition this slip does not mean this u1 velocity applied. This slip means there is a relative slip between the moving boundary and the fluid in contact and here no slip means there is no such slip between the moving boundary and the fluid in contact. Now keeping this in mind let us look at the Poissoli flow situation. So this is a case where there is a flow happening in a horizontal channel from left towards right which means this is a zone of high pressure then this is a zone of low pressure somehow created maybe in the laboratory using some instrument and the fluid is moving from left towards right. And we know from the derivations for the Newtonian viscous fluids this profile is parabolic in nature. So what is happening at these two points there is no movement happening. But if there is a slip boundary condition then the fluid moves in this manner that the point A goes to A dash and point B goes to B dash. So a sort of translation takes place. So in case of such a translation we say that this is a slip boundary condition. Even though I did not apply any shear movement of the walls, there is now a relative slip between the static wall and the fluid here. So it is a width slip boundary condition and a Poissoli flow. So what we were discussing in all this deduction and we will be discussing more, essentially we have talked about the no slip boundary condition. Now the point is in the geological case which one is happening no slip boundary condition or the slip boundary condition I mean the geological deformation of the rocks in shear zones we do not know but we tend to think that the no slip boundary condition is happening develop the numericals and compare with the prototype. But it will be important for us to think can we discriminate slip boundary condition from no slip boundary condition in the field. In a no slip boundary condition in case of an inclined channel and where the Poissoli flow is taking place, flow against gravity, there is a component and the coet shear is also working. We are now going to see the deformation in a different way. I have said earlier we are essentially dealing with laminar flow. So, if this is the deformation it means that each and every point from the initial position has traveled in linear and in parallel fashion. This is the material point movement and this point pivot or neutral point does not move at all. So this is the coet flow. Now take the case of a Poissoli flow flow taking from left towards the right hand side direction and a parabolic profile is conceived. So what is happening for each of these points again all the points are moving mutually parallel to each other and in straight line. Now if both are taking place that coet flow is taking place and the 
Poissouli flow is also taking place simultaneously. What does that mean? That means that there is a shear and also there is a high pressure and low pressure situation created. Now imagine I am talking about coet plus Poissouli shear. If there were only Poissouli flow, what would have happened? A parabolic profile. And if there were only coet flow, what would have happened? This linear profile. Now the question is, what will be the profile when both are taking place? We start with this point. If there is only Poissouli flow, flow, then this point does not move, it remains in the same place. Whereas if there is a coet flow, this point comes there. So the together effect of coet flow and Poissouli flow will be that this material point comes over here. Similarly, look at this point. If there is only Poissouli flow, this point is not moving. Whereas if there is only coet flow, this point comes here. So what is the combined effect if both of them are acting? this point would come here. Okay. Now I take a point say over here. If there is only Poissouli flow working then this much will be the displacement and if there is only coet flow working then this much will be the displacement. So if I give some name say this is point small p this is point Q and this is small r. Then I mean that PQ is the total displacement if only Poissouli flow is working. Whereas PR if only coet flow is working. Now the question is if both are working what will happen? We can see we can consider them like vector they are in the same direction. So if both are working in that case the total velocity must be PQ plus PR total distance should be taken. So PR is already there and I have to add this PQ distance. So this is P, this is Q, I call it Q dash and I can write PQ distance is equal to RQ dash distance. PQ distance, this much length I have drawn from RQ dash. So I can say the PQ dash distance, PQ dash distance is, is equal to PQ plus PR distance. PQ plus PR distance. So what has happened? Point P will have a velocity indicated by the PQ dash length. So in this way each point I can keep on working. What is the final, what is the velocity at each of these representative points? And after plotting all of them if I join I will come up with this kind of a velocity profile. The yellow curve that I have drawn passes through this point because I said if both coet flow and the Poissouli flow are working this point comes over here. If both coet and Poissouli flow are working this point comes over there and for intermediate points I have demonstrated. So for each of the points if I keep doing this exercise I will come with a parabola and this is what was derived in terms of the velocity profile. So I would request the students not just to believe what I told but to do this exercise on the graph sheet in your practical copy. So what you are asked to do, do this it will take some time but you will be very clear what is happening. You draw these two boundaries, draw a vertical line then this is some velocity profile shown for the coet flow and then here you meticulously draw a parabola. 
with the vertex equidistant from the boundaries. How to draw the parabola? We can think this as the say y axis, this as the x axis and create or write down several points coordinates x and y coordinates so that this parabolic profile is produced. After that manually you can plot all those points and then join that by a smooth curve that will become parabola. I know it will take time but it is good to do once. Now you have got this white curve indicating the Poissoli flow and this line indicating the coet flow. Now from each point to point you have to add the distances as I have done here. Like this point goes over there. So here the combination of coet and Poissoli flow will be this point comes over that point this point comes over that point and for all the points do what I have said here and you will be generating a resultant velocity profile like this. So there will be several points that you will be getting join them by a smooth curve and it is the parabola.